In this uh, brief lecture, we're going to talk about the model for evidence-based practice uh, that is presented in your textbook, Clinician's Guide to Research Methods and Family Therapy. Uh, and this model that I'll be referring to is covered in chapters um, 12 through 16 in your text. Um, and on the syllabus, I've indicated that I'd like you to kind of skim through 12, 14, 15, and 16. Those are going to be the ones most important to uh, completing your portfolio paper. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the evidence-based practice model um, and particularly the components of that model that include appraising and applying. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about your portfolio paper. So evidence-based practice model is covered in chapter 12 of your text. And this is essentially what it looks like. Um, so thinking about evidence-based practice, this is about the thoughtful, critical, intentional integration of research evidence into your clinical work. Uh, and this is important, uh, one, because it's part of your ethical code, um, but two, that it is important to be incorporating updated material and the best science uh, that is available into sort of what we know about people and their problems and how they change. So when you're thinking about evidence-based practice, so basing your clinical practice in evidence, this is really a four component model. And only one component of that is research evidence. So what are you finding in journal articles? And then you take that information, the best available research evidence that you can find, and you think about that in comparison to your own clinical training and clinical experience, um, what your client wants and needs, and also the environmental and organizational context in which you are practicing. Uh, I'm going to go into these a little bit further in just a moment. So how do you use EBP? So you want to integrate these four components to make clinical decisions. What does that look like? So our authors discuss this as a five-step process. Ask, acquire, appraise, apply, analyze, and adjust. Um, we have already done some of these steps. So in the ask process, this is what you did when you chose a topic that was of interest to you. You asked a question related to clinical work or your own life, something you wanted to know more about that you thought could be answered by research literature. Acquire, this is what we did in the library session. We learned how to locate relevant and quality research articles to help you answer your question. Appraise is what you'll be doing in your annotated bibliography. You're going to provide some thoughtful analysis or critique of the research. Uh, its strengths and weaknesses, and its applicability to your clinical practice. Apply is really a, for the portfolio paper. So in the portfolio paper, you're going to expand on the applicability portion you talk about in your annotated bibliography. Um, how applicable is this research to your clinical practice? And you'll do that by thinking about that four-component model of EBP that we just covered in the last slide. So thinking more about appraising, just a couple quick tips to identify high quality research, right? One, there should be, it should be introduced by a literature review that builds the case for why the study was conducted and clearly identifies what the purpose of the study is and what the research questions are. The method should be detailed. You should be able to find the answers to your questions in the method section. Uh, you'll recall from the statistics class the other day that there was sometimes information uh, that I felt was important that was missing from these studies and that was frustrating. And it doesn't mean that the study itself isn't quality, it just means that the authors didn't give me enough information to, to really um, be critical of it and be thoughtful about it in the way that I'd like. A good article is going to give you a detailed description of how they analyze their data. Now, for a lot of studies that are quantitative, this is going to be looking at statistics. Uh, for qualitative research, which we'll cover soon, this is going to be thinking about how did they look at the 
text that was available and pull out themes and codes and how do they do this in a, in a rigorous and trustworthy manner. And then what they found, which we talked about this week, did they find statistical significance and is it clinically significant? And, and, and a lot of authors will talk about that. And a good article is going to talk about the clinical impact or the real life significance of what they found. And every article should really draw cautious conclusions. Like I've said before, we don't uh, prove anything in these studies. Uh, we find evidence to support hypotheses. Sometimes, sometimes we don't. Um, but we really can't say anything for certain. Um, keep in mind that no study and no journal article is going to be perfect. So I'm not looking for you to find the perfect article and I'm not looking for you to tear apart every single article just to show me that you have done some thinking about the strengths and limitations of this article and that you're able to do that thinking because of what we've learned in class. So in your annotated bibliography, you should note limitations of a study or an article if you've found them, but you're not expected to do an in-depth critique. All right, so how do we apply the EBP model to your clinical practice, which is what you'll be doing in your portfolio paper? So you've got the research evidence part down. You've found those articles, you're summarizing them and you're thinking about them in your annotated bib. So then you have to think about the other three components of the model, client context, preferences, and needs. So we can't just read a study and blindly apply it to our clients. Um, and if you've read a study about an intervention that works, we can't just assume that an intervention works for everybody. So you really have to think about how are your clients different from or similar to the sample? Are these meaningful differences? Um, would this treatment or does this information help your client reach their goals? Particularly if you're looking at an intervention, does your client have the time and the resources to participate in this treatment? Remember, sometimes we're looking at intervention studies that require high time commitment. And if you're not being paid to participate, it might just you might not be able to do it feasibly. And then something else to think about is what if your client requests a particular treatment? Then what do you do? Let's say a client comes in and they want emotion-focused couples therapy. They've read that there's a lot of evidence to back up the efficacy and effectiveness of that model. And they ask, can you do this? How do you respond to that? You have to think about your own clinical training and experience. So what is it, as an MFT, what is important to you when you're doing your clinical work? What do you know how to do? Are there interventions that you found evidence for, such as EFT, that might require specialized training? How do you go about getting trained? Or do you make a referral to somebody who is trained? And most importantly, you want to think about the fact that you're an MFT and you're a systemic thinker. So you want to be thinking about, is the study systemic? Is it conducted in a systemic way or based in a systemic theory? And if not, can you incorporate the information that you've learned into a systemic perspective? So you may read a, a linear study or um, some cause and effect findings that you don't think fit into a systemic perspective, but can you still learn from it and incorporate it into a systemic perspective? Can you still make use of this information? And finally, you have to think about where you work. Um, can you incorporate this research evidence feasibly where you work? So if you found intervention studies, can you do those interventions at your agency? Is that something that your supervisors would support you doing? Um, sometimes you'll work in an agency and you can only do one kind of treatment um, because they require you to do a manualized intervention. Um, is this something that would work where you are at? And this is probably one of the more simpler, easier questions to answer. What can you take from the research that you're reading and incorporate with these other three components? I want you to think about what seem to be the most important takeaways from the research you read? Can those be integrated into your practice in a thoughtful way? Or if it can't be integrated into your practice, can you continue to be a systemic thinker, but use this information perhaps to make referrals? Um, 
right, so let's think about your portfolio paper. Here is the prompt for the portfolio paper, which is also in your syllabus. Please describe an example of how you have or plan to engage in evidence-based practice. Discuss how you integrated the following four components of EBP to make the best use of research in your clinical practice. So, the four I've already mentioned a few times. Research evidence, your clinical training or experience, your clients, and your organization. Make sure to apply this model to a specific client or treatment issue. Don't give me an abstract paper. I want you to have a specific case and example so that you can actually apply all four components. So as you can see, the question is aligned with the EBP model we've, we just discussed. It's aligned with the learning goals for this course. When writing the portfolio paper, you should draw from the research that you read for your annotated bibliography. However, the portfolio paper will be less focused on the research methodology, and it's going to include a bit more reflection on the process of making use of research in clinical practice. If you're not yet in clinical practice, then you're going to have to write a hypothetical paper. Um, you will have to make hypotheses about number three and number four, uh, who your clients will be, what your context is. You can make up a case to use. Uh, you have some creative license with this. The point is that you have an example. You can show me how you might do this in your actual practice. Um, perhaps you can rely on a classmate with clinical experience to help you think through what this would look like in real life or to help give you a case example. And also be careful to use um, correct tenses when writing your paper. Um, if this is an actual case, and this is something you've done, perhaps you write in the past tense. If you're not in clinical training, then this is more of a hypothetical. I would do this, I would do that. Um, just think about the tenses that you're using when you write this paper. So uploaded on Blackboard in this week's folder um, is a guided rough draft for your research portfolio paper. And so that kind of is just some questions to get you thinking and organizing your paper. Um, what specifically were you trying to answer with your literature search? So far, what have you been finding? Um, and how do you incorporate what you have been finding with your own clinical training? And how do you think this is relevant to the population or the clients that you're thinking of? Um, where are you practicing therapy or where do you think you might be practicing therapy in the future? And can you incorporate that into those settings? And, and another thing to think about the last question is, um, what was this process like of using research to inform your clinical practice? And what's your plan for continuing to be a research informed clinician in the future. So take a look, download that guided rough draft, and as you're writing your annotated bibliography, you can be thinking about how you're really going to um, expand on this in your clinical practice and start applying it. Thanks.